All right, in this uh, screencast, we're looking at uh, the church councils. Primarily, we're going to take some time and walk through the, the issue at the Council of Nicaea, the Arian heresy, right? Um, but we're going to do that with an eye on what exactly the church council is and what it is doing. Uh, there's going to be quite a few church councils, um, and you're going to hear me talk about the Council of uh, Chalcedon or Chalcedon. Uh, after we talk a little bit about the Council of Nicaea, but what I want to what I want to establish with Nicaea and the Arian heresy or the Arian issue is um, just how the church begins to deal with some of these issues um, that they're going to call heresy, okay, and and how the church is trying to establish what is right teaching, what is orthodox teaching. Um, in, in the process of holding these councils and what it is trying to say, this is, this is outside the realm of proper Christian doctrine, okay? And so we're going to use Nicaea and the Arian heresy as kind of a model to have that discussion about broader church councils and how that relates back to some of our um, ideas, people, issues, etc. in philosophy. So uh, heresy in the church councils. Really, we begin with Arius, because unless you know what's going on with Arius and the Arian heresy and the Arian controversy, then the rest of this doesn't make any sense to you. So first, Arius is a, um, uh, a part of the church. He's, he's a leader in it. Um, I believe he was uh, a parish priest. He's at least a theologian, okay? And he comes into conflict with his bishop, a man by the name of Alexander, concerning the nature of Jesus Christ. Uh, Arius believed that because God is one and is totally transcendent, then Jesus Christ had to be a creature, a created being that has a definite starting point, an, an absolute beginning, and the phrase, there was when he was not. Uh, sort of becomes Arius' mantra. He takes very seriously the language um, where the, the sun is in subject to or is somehow limited in comparison to the Father. So, for example, uh, when Jesus says, nobody knows the day or the hour, not even the Son, but only the Father, uh, Arius says that's an indication that Jesus is limited, uh, and limited in such a manner that he could not also be God um, in the fullest sense, right? Fully God, fully man. He must be a created being because he does not possess the same knowledge as the Father. Okay? Um, now, he's the Son of God as God's first and very special creature in God's creative activity, and he's just sort of set aside to do the work that Jesus is going to do for us in the Gospels until it's time to do that work but he's a creature, okay? He's a created being. Um, this idea of the subjectivity, the subjectedness, I guess, of the Son to the Father is something that the, the, the teaching of the church has been trying to work out up until this point. And Arius, uh, if he only does one positive thing, he forces the church then to, to really become clear on what is going on in some of these passages where it seems like Jesus is just in total subjection to uh, the Father and how he can still be fully God and fully man if that's the issue, okay? And so Arius begins um, writing and teaching and challenging some of the things that uh, folks like Irenaeus and Origen uh, and our earlier church um, earlier church fathers and things had established, and, and he's, he's pressing these very critical, uh, very defining doctrines of Christianity. Um, Christianity is really only Christianity if we agree on these doctrines about Christ. Or at least um, that's how the church is looking at it during the time of Arius. I would tend to agree with them, right? Christianity is only really Christianity if we can say these things about God and about Jesus Christ, okay? Um, and unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you want to look at this, 
uh, a lot of the controversy centers around the person and work of Jesus Christ and the nature of God as Trinity. Uh, ultimately, Arius isn't as concerned about the Trinity. It's a secondary issue for him um, because you can't have a Trinity if Jesus Christ is not fully God and fully man. But the primary issue for him is the person and work, really the person, the nature of Jesus Christ. There was when he was not. Jesus Christ is a creature. He's a created being who is the Son of God. Now, his bishop and others vehemently disagree with him. And, and they continue to teach the idea that Jesus Christ is fully God and fully man. He is fully divine and he is fully human. And so these individuals trying to balance these two natures of Jesus Christ in the one individual are, 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 are arguing, and, and we would even argue today, that those moments where Jesus Christ in the Gospels seems to be limited or even says, like, I don't know the day or the hour when the return is supposed to happen, but the Father knows. Uh, those are intentional self-limitations Jesus takes upon himself in the incarnation. And so it's not a limiting of um, Jesus because he's not God. It's an intentional limiting of Jesus during the period of time that he is incarnate. Um, during the period of time that he is here, prior to the resurrection where he is working out the plan of salvation, okay? And, and those limitations go away again when Jesus is, um, is resurrected after the resurrection. Those limitations that he imposed upon himself, being fully God and fully man, those limitations go away again when he is resurrected and taken back to be with the Father, the resurrection and the ascension. So, uh, the Council of Nicaea. Uh, the location of the council is a place called Nicaea. Uh, it's a council. It's a gathering of the bishops of the church. Now, at the time, we're talking about Emperor Constantine. And Constantine, um, if, we're, if, we're, if we're totally honest, there's a little bit of a political agenda here um, in the Council of Nicaea for Constantine. But there's also a genuine theological concern here at the Council of Constantine, or at the Council of Nicaea called by Emperor Constantine. And, and he's... He's trying to have this issue of the, the Aryan conflict settled. And so he calls this council to figure out answers to the challenge presented by Arius. Is Jesus Christ a created being? Or is he the fully God, fully man, eternally existent son of God, this second person of the Trinity? Without getting all into all of the details of the council, the, the end result of the council is this. Jesus Christ is fully God, fully man. He has two natures. Okay? Um, he is divine. He's begotten by the Father, not created. He's not a creature. He, and he's of one substance with the Father. Now, I keep saying that the, the, the council at Nicaea is, is pushing this idea that Jesus Christ is fully God and fully man. Yes, but the focus in Nicaea is anti-Aryan. And so the idea there is, no, 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 Jesus is not a creature. He is divine. He's God. And so we're going to see in the council of Nicaea and its sort of decree here, Jesus Christ is divine. And he's begotten of the Father, but he is not created of the Father. Jesus is not a creature. He's not created. He has an eternal nature, just like the Father does. He is eternally begotten of the Father. And he is one substance with the Father. They are the same essence, the same divinity. Okay. Now, later, uh, the Council of Chalcedon is actually going to be called to, to settle these natures of Jesus Christ. Because following the Arian decision in condemning the teaching of Arius okay, and denying the full divinity of Christ in that teaching, the church says, no, no, that is heresy. That's outside the realm of Orthodox Christian thinking. Jesus Christ is fully God. What begins to be the discussion is, is how do these two natures in Christ work? Okay, 
Is it that he is divine and he appeared to be human? Is it that he is human and appeared to be divine? Or is it that he is fully divine and fully human? How do we understand and explain exactly how Jesus Christ is fully God and fully man? There are a series of other issues, conflicts, um, heresy in the sense of choice initially, and then heresy in the sense of the church council, as in these are now condemned thought, not proper Christian doctrine, right, not orthodoxy, at and after the council of Chalcedon. And so Chalcedon settles the issue that Jesus Christ is, is one person. He's not two separate people somehow merged to appear like one person, uh, which was uh, one of these issues presented. He's not um, fully divine and just appears to be human. He's not fully human and appears to be divine. He is one individual with two natures. It's not a 50-50 split. He's not some kind of hybrid, some kind of demigod like Hercules, perhaps. Um, he is fully divine. And he is fully human. Okay? He's not Jesus, the man from Nazareth, and the Christ. He is Jesus, the Christ. One person, two natures, fully at work in his person. This is a mysterious thing. We don't necessarily understand exactly how these two things relate one to another. But really, this is the issue. Okay? A lot of our fourth century concern about the Trinity grows out of these Christological controversies. And, and we begin to try, we, we begin to move from, well, if Jesus is not this fully God, fully man, if he is something other than that, then what about this Trinity thing? Or if he is, then how does the Trinity, if he is fully God, fully man, how does the Trinity relate one to itself? Uh, what is the, the nature and essence of God as Trinity? And in the 4th century, we're going to see the shift in focus from Jesus Christ at Nicaea and Chalcedon and into the issue of God as Trinity. Okay, and so our Christological concerns, our theologies about Jesus Christ, lead us to concerns about the Trinity. And Orthodox theology begins to be defined and considered as God is the Trinity. And the Trinity is one God. Okay, and we get into some key wording here. There is one usia, one being, okay, one essence of divinity, and there are three persons, three Greek word hypostases or individuals. And so you have the Father as an individual, the Son as an individual, and the Spirit, the Holy Spirit as an individual. Those are individuals of one essence, and so that is three of one essence. It's three in one. And this is our orthodox teaching of the Trinity. Okay, and um, it grows out of this controversy about Jesus Christ. Now, our philosophical connection here. Uh, this is a little bit more about method. Um, and, and you'll remember from Socrates, right? The method was playing the fool and asking questions. The method was how do we dialogue between these opinions to come to a better understanding of the truth? Uh, as far as the councils were concerned, they considered the dialogues between uh, the teaching of the church councils, the teaching affirmed in the church councils, and uh, folks like Arius and some of these other individuals uh, who are presenting what will be condemned by the church. Um, this dialogue is productive for the church, in their perspective, in that it helps them most clearly define, or as best as they can define, what is right Christian thought, what is right Christian doctrine, what is Orthodox Christianity. On the flip side of that, this is where we see those Christian dialogues being a pretty significant departure from our, uh, our philosophic friends where Socrates would get into dialogue with others and disagree with them, or say that they may not be correct, um, he, he wasn't as quick to condemn them as the church here in the councils. Okay, um, Again, the church is primarily concerned with this is orthodox, this is right, this is proper Christian theology. And they believe that based on the teachings of the church, 
and the teachings of the scripture, like Irenaeus and Origen, there is a right Christian answer. And outside of that right Christian answer, things cease to be Christian. The conversations and the dialogic methods of our philosophers in the past are more concerned with finding ways to get right answers, to get answers to these truths that we need to better understand. Okay, And so there's a little bit less of this exclusivity where we begin to exclude people in the church because what they believe is heretical, Okay, the wrong choice really is what they're, they're saying here in the councils. And philosophy's difference is this idea of we can disagree, but perhaps something in what you have to say will, will help me in an understanding of what I believe. And so there's a little bit more of a welcomed attitude in philosophy to have these kind of conversations, where in the church it becomes much more, um, we have to reject we have to push away. We, we have to condemn these kinds of teachings and thoughts. So from a, method, uh, from, a, from a methods perspective, philosophy is much more comfortable with this dialogue of differing opinion. The church is concerned that the dialogue of differing opinion is going to lead people to wrong belief that jeopardizes the stability of the church, that jeopardizes the truth, and that jeopardizes the soul of the individual the church is trying to save. And so what we get um, as a consequence of some of these church council decisions is Christian faith is not only that uh, personal and corporate faith and trust, hope and trust in a relationship with God, but it is also um, Christian faith is characterized by intellectual belief in core Christian doctrine, okay? Um, Plato and Socrates, much more comfortable with the exchange of idea. The church uh, seems to be a little bit more concerned with these exchanges of idea because the, there might be error there, okay? And, and the church is trying to establish, uh, like Irenaeus and Origen did in the past, this is proper and right and good, and these things are outside the boundaries and are dangerous, perhaps. They are definitely heretical, according to the church, and they, they jeopardize some things for us. Now, from a methods perspective, philosophy is more comfortable with a dialogue of idea. The church is a little more afraid of it, probably. Um, but... Where the church here begins to share ideas with some of our, our ancient philosophers are these uh, ideas, uh, these concepts that there are truths that are eternal, that are immutable, and that are knowable, right? Um, Socrates and Plato and Democritus argued for certain things as true and absolute and eternal immutable, these unchanging things that we can rely on when we talk about truth and when we talk about right and wrong. The church will share that kind of an opinion. There is right thing to be known. But the church is going to be a lot more concerned with the dialogue of differing opinion. Because for the church, it's not just exchange of idea to come to better understanding. There's risk in these variants of thought. There's risk in areas. If somebody does not believe in the person of Jesus Christ as defined by Orthodox Christianity, is there risk to their salvation? Are they genuinely Christian then? These are the questions being asked. And, and the response of the church, in especially Nicaea and Chalcedon, is that the acceptance of these things begins to push people away from right belief and sort of precariously toward okay, uh, a dangerous spiritual position where perhaps they're in jeopardy of not being saved. The difference between schools of philosophic thought and the church, then, is 
I don't necessarily have to be full-fledged all in on platonic thought to be in line with Plato. I don't have to be all in on everything Plato has to say. Whereas with the church, I have to be all in with orthodoxy or I risk being run out of the church. And historically here with the church councils, the risk of being excommunicated and cut off from the church is not just, well, you have to find a new place to go to church. It's you're going to be cut off from those graces that God administers through the church that allows you into right relationship with God. And so being cut off from the church by being condemned as a heretic actually places you in a position where you might not have access to the saving grace of God. While I might agree that there are proper Christian doctrines, I'm not always totally comfortable with the idea of saying, now you've gone too far and you're probably not going to be saved. That judgment for me, uh, I'm going to leave that judgment up to God. The church councils, however, are going to take that step. You are condemned, they say to Arius as a heretic. You are excommunicated from the church. You are cut off from the grace of God administered through the church. And now Arius is kind of condemned forever. Um, I disagree with Arius. I don't think his theology is correct. I, th I do think it is unorthodox. I think it is heretical. I think there is orthodox theology that is Jesus Christ is fully God and fully man. And Jesus is one individual, one person with two natures. The Trinity is one God, one usia, one essence, one being, and three hypostases, three individuals, three persons. Okay? That, I believe, is orthodox Christian theology. I'm going to leave up to God to make the judgments on whether or not those individuals who agree with Arius are saved. At what point in time, and this is a question I wrestle with, and it's something I'm going to ask you to wrestle with, at, at what point in time does not believing orthodox Christian teaching become no longer being Christian? Okay. Are there doctrines that we're willing to disagree on and still say Christian brother in Christ, like the gifts of the Spirit, or perhaps... Um, Differing opinions on baptism, the Catholic Church versus the Baptists, for example. And what things are core Christian doctrine that have to be there for you to say, this is Christianity. That, in essence, is what the Church Council is trying to answer, and the Church Councils are, are looking for here. What is Christianity? And what is other than Christianity? Okay? The judgments of cut off from the graces administered through the church um, is, is a step they felt they needed to take in protection of the church and in protection of Orthodox Christianity. Um, again, uh, our church friends here in, in, in the councils are, are a lot more uncomfortable with a dialogue of differing opinion when that differing opinion is what they consider to be outside proper, right Christian teaching, right Christian doctrine, okay? And so we'll pick up with some, uh, some discussion here in class based on, on your information 